Uh, so we're going to open the Word of God to Acts chapter 2 once again. If you'll turn to Acts 2 in your Bible. And today we're going to have verses 40 through 47. Aunt Lee, I believe, has the reading for us. That's on page 1254 in your pew Bible, if you're using your pew Bible. So Acts 2, starting in verse 40. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Acts chapter 2, 40 through 47. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simpl sim simplicity of the heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And praise the Lord for his word. All right, let's thank God for his word. Father, uh, once again, it's our privilege to hear your voice through the word. Uh, we pray, Holy Spirit, that now you would teach us, that you would uh, open up uh, to us the sacred page, and that you would uh, dispense the bread of life, Lord, so that we may eat and grow and uh, become fruitful for you, uh, Lord Jesus Christ. We ask it in your name, amen. amen. All right, so verse 40, as you can see, is the tag end of something, uh, right? We've been through a, a, quite a sermon. It says, with many other words, what were the main words? Well, it was Peter's, um, and this is what we've been studying for a few weeks, Peter's uh, first sermon, right? So the, this is literally the first post-resurrection uh, public uh, announcement of the gospel, right? Jesus... Jesus of Nazareth, he is the Christ. He is God's anointed one, uh, the one that you condemned and crucified. God has raised him up from the dead. God has seated him on high in his right hand, and he has made him Lord over all. Right? That was sort of the climactic point of Peter's uh, Pentecost Day sermon. And we've seen previously how convincing his words were. Right? What was the effect of his preaching uh, uh, what was the effect that that had on the crowd gathered there in Jerusalem for the, uh, for the holiday? They were cut to the heart, right? They felt the heavy weight of their guilt weigh down upon them. They felt the fear of God. And uh, importantly, they reacted to it. They responded to it. They made haste to avail themselves of the, uh, the divine pardon that's uh, offered to them, extended to them, right? The words of Peter pricked them in the heart. And they reacted, they responded. In a word, the Christian church was born, right? This is a new creation, right? Nine o'clock in the morning that morning, the Holy Spirit, if you like, invested uh, those original 120 disciples. And by the end of that day, right after many other words, as it says here, it was over 3,000 souls. Okay, so um, you could say, as with the first creation, that God saw that what he had uh, created, he looked at it, and behold, it was good, right? Uh, this, this passage of scripture is quite fantastic, isn't it? What a lovely description of the early, uh, the early I'd say, infant church. Um, something we sometimes uh, like to think about is how, how the world was back when it was brand new, right? What was life like in the Garden of Eden uh, before it was disrupted by sin and, and deception and rivalry and so on, um, you know, sometimes we like to go look with a lot of curiosity and sort of really 
pick through the first couple of chapters of, of Genesis and, and gather as much information as we can to try to investigate, you know, what was, the, what was the pristine state of the world when God first made man? Uh, well, it's kind of like this with this part of Acts, this, this uh, piece at the end of Acts chapter 2. You could say there's kind of a parallel with the first creation, right? Here we have, if you like, a new creation. And when God was finished uttering his word and, you know, the spirit of Christ had, had formed and molded and, and filled, when it was all finished, it was good. Okay, we see this, this ideal, pristine fellowship of saints that's absolutely wonderful. Okay, now, of course, in the same way that it happened with the first creation, Sin entered the world, right? Uh, things will not stay in this ideal state uh, indefinitely. Okay, and of course, we're not dealing with perfect people here, are we? We're not dealing with uh, completely sinless uh, people in this scene, but they are redeemed people, and they're genuinely redeemed, right? So this is, uh, if you like, the beautiful beginning. I feel like the present-day church ought to always study the very early days of the church's existence and, and reflect upon them and, and in the same sort of way, go over these passages with a fine-tooth comb so that we can try to, um, you know, we ask, you know, what did they have that was so special? You know, what made it so uh, successful and, and peaceful? And if possible, to what extent can it be recaptured? Okay, I mean, look at the condition of the world today with all the division and sin and, and sorrow, you can look around the world and people ask, you know, how did things get to be this way? You know, is this how it's always been? And of course the Bible tells you, no, it's not how it's always been. You know, God made the world very good, but we've run it off the rails, right? Men have corrupted what God created by our sin, our selfishness, our bitterness, uh, like we got to today, we got to this point by some sequence of events that, that led us here, but originally God's, God made something that was much better than what we have, it was much purer than what we have uh, today. And it's the same sort of idea with the church on earth. Look at the state that it's in. Uh, is this, you know, people ask, is this something God has done? You know, is this God's doing? Look at the disunity. Look at the factions. Look at the, uh, the, the worldliness of it, the pollutions and, you know, this uh, doctrinally, this confusion of, you know, who knows what's even right? How do we get all these different uh, mishmash of opinions and so on and teachings? Like, has it always been this way? And the answer is no, of course not. It hasn't always been this way. This, what we have today is far from the original state in which the church was, uh, was, was created. Okay? It's because of the same cause. It's the evil one, right? He has come in. He has infiltrated, and he has caused all, all kinds of chaos because that's what he does, right? He, he attacks and corrupts the good works of God, and he infects them, and he distorts them. So, you know, there's no way he was going to leave the church alone when it was brand new, Okay, and it's like the parable of the tares, right? This, the sower, uh, the son of man sowed, what did he sow? He sowed good seed, right? He sowed good seed in his field. And then an enemy came in and he sowed the tares, right? So who has done this? It's an enemy, okay? So we've gotten to this point in which the church today finds itself by a certain chain of events. And if we hope to improve the state of the church, okay, and you could say church with a capital C, but like even if we just wanted to improve the state of our own local church, uh, we, we should investigate the original state of the church. What was it like in the beautiful beginning? And that would give us something to aim at, right? Something to try to, you know, a, a goal to restore ourselves to, right? If, you're, if something's broken and you want to know how to fix it, you have to know, well, what did it look like when it was new? You know, how did it function? How did it work? And so on and so forth, okay? So the Lord has given us a couple of passages of Scripture, of which this is one of them, um, to where he describes what that freshly minted, uncorrupted body of believers was like, okay? So again, not talking about perfect people, 
right? These are all redeemed sinners, right? We're not talking about absolutely sinless people, but they are all genuine believers, right? They were all truly reborn uh, new beings in Christ, okay? They had their hearts made new by the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. And as we see here, people who are like that uh, act in a certain way and they do certain things Whereas churches today are, you know, who knows, you know, they're loaded with plenty of people who have never, um, you know, they don't act in this way and they don't do these things and, you know, it tells you there's, there's a problem. Uh, so here's, here's one passage. We'll have another one quite similar to it when we get to chapter four. Um, but between those two especially, we really have something very lovely and beautiful set before us, which I think all genuine Christian hearts uh, would would long to see restored, like we wish could wish could be recovered. Okay, you know we often pray for revival, fresh movement of the Holy Spirit, things like that. Well, what does a movement of the Holy Spirit actually look like? Well, it will look very much like this. Okay, so we need to take a look, and uh, we'll work our way through these verses a little bit at a time. I'm sure we'll take it into next week. Um, let's start with verse 40. And it says, with uh, many other words, Peter testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Okay, so this is first and foremost, uh, you see the stark, clear call from Peter uh, to separate oneself, right? Be saved from, come out from among and be separate. Why? Because this crooked generation or this perverse generation is heading for the judgment of God. It's heading for destruction. And you and I are among them unless something changes. Right? All sinners are going to be swept away in the judgment when God, when a righteous God purges the earth. And the message is there is one Redeemer and Savior that God has sent to snatch us from the floodwaters and stand us up safely on the shore, right? This Jesus who I preach to you, right? This Jesus who was crucified, buried, raised again, and has sat down on high at the right hand of God, be saved from, right? Come out from among, be reconciled to God. As uh, Paul would say later, what fellowship can righteousness have with lawlessness, right? You have to be separate. What communion does light have with darkness? What part do believers have with unbelievers, right? What can Christ ever have in common with the evil one, right? What can Christ have in common with this devil-filled world? God has said, I will dwell in my people and I will walk among them and be their God and they will be my people and Paul says, if that is to be so, you must therefore come out from among this perverse generation and be separate. Says the Lord, do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you and be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters. Okay, so Peter says, be saved from. Have you been convinced yourself, right? You really need to ask yourself this. Have you been convinced that it is imperative that you be saved from this corrupt generation? Or are you still among them, right? Or have you been picked up and out and set apart? Okay, Jesus said, I have come to make a division, right? I, I've come to set people apart. I've come to establish, if you like, a new, uh, a new, a new category of man, right? The, those who are in me a new creation. Okay, have you understood that you must be lifted up and out from among this perishing and doomed generation? Otherwise, you too are going to be swept away. You too are doomed to perish. Right? If Christ doesn't save you, you're going to be lost and there's going to be no remedy. Right? Swept away in the judgment. So come out from among and be saved from. Now, every single person in this ideal, this initial Christian community that we look at here at the end of Acts 2, every one of these 3,000 heard that message loud and clear and responded to Peter's uh, plea, be saved from. Is that the message that you've been hearing? 
Is that the reason why you are here? Is that the message that all the preachers uh, are preaching? Now, I don't think that message has been ringing out uh, for the last 2,000 years as consistently uh, as Peter would have liked. Right? I don't think it's rung out with as much clarity as this in all of the churches since then. And so that's a big reason why the church is in the state that it's currently in. Because many people have been in churches who've never been convinced uh, of their need to be rescued from out the flood of judgment, right? And so they haven't laid hold of the, uh, the arm of Christ that's outstretched to save, to be plucked out of the, uh, of the waters, right? No, they're still among this generation, right? It's still running after all the things that unbelievers run after, still worshiping the same idols, still con uh, committing the same sins and so on, right? The words has come out from among, be separate. Touch not what is unclean and I will receive you, says the Lord. Okay, I will be a father to you. You'll be my sons and daughters. And Paul says, beloved, since we have a promise like that, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that pollutes the body and everything that pollutes the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Okay, the true Christian sees himself, therefore, as no longer a member and citizen of this age. Right? I am no longer in this category. I am now in this category. Okay? I am to the world now. I am an outsider. I am a, a pilgrim just traveling through. I have to be here for a while, but I'm not putting roots down here. I am not uh, 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 anymore um, uh, participating in the same sorts of things that the unbelievers participate in. I'm not joining myself to the citizenship of this age. This age is perishing. Okay, so I have to be on the outside. Now my identity is in this separate group. Okay, that's the question. How is it with you? Okay, are you among those who heard that message clearly, be saved from, and responded to the word with eagerness saying, Lord, save me. Save me a sinner. Right, knowing, here's the promise, whoever says, whoever calls, will be saved. Right? Call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. That's one of the main, that's the main uh, characteristic of this early group of 3,000 that made that bunch so, uh, uh, so lovely and, and makes this passage of scripture so wonderful to read. They're all saved. They're genuinely saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so the next verse is verse 41. Uh, what did each of these 3,000 people do by way of response? Okay, it says those who gladly received Peter's word were baptized, which is to say uh, that each one of them publicly and visibly gave a testimony that they have taken their stand with this Jesus, with Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Son of God, Jesus the Messiah, publicly, visibly testifying that they are forsaking leaving behind this perishing world with its ignorance and with its sin, and they're trusting in God's King and Messiah, and they're receiving from him the free gift, the, the washing from sin, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit of God, which is what makes a man new. Okay? And Paul says in one place, describes it as putting on Christ, right? like you put on a, a, a robe. Okay, I'm putting on Christ. That's, that's uh, one of the ways that Paul uh, describes baptism, right? It is an act of the will uh, in response to the conviction of the heart through the preached word, uh, through the word of Christ. Right? Jesus said, confess me before men, and I will confess you before my Father in heaven. Okay, that's baptism. And now the church, of course, over the ages, you know, we're 2,000 years downstream from this, uh, the church has made rather a muddle out of baptism, okay? We baptize people who are kind of wishy-washy or, uh, or uncertain about what they believe. Uh, we baptize um, uh, people who can't really even clearly answer the question, why do you want to be baptized? Uh, we baptize people who are too little to even talk. Uh, we baptize uh, young people who um, really are just under pressure from mom and dad and from the pastor to get baptized. Uh, you know, we have all kinds of practices about baptism. Um, different denominations do it different ways. They have their reasons. 
uh, how did we get to this point? You know, you want to say, how did, how did the church arrive and make such a muddle out of baptism? How, how did it get to be so confusing? Okay, and what can we do about it? Well, I'll tell you what we can do about it is go back to the beginning, right? You have to go back to the beginning of the church, right? The answer isn't to ask, what did my parents' generation do, or the one before that, or what did the reformers do, or what did the Catholic Church do, or what did the medieval church do, or whoever. No, right here. Go back to the source. You have Acts, you have Romans, you have Colossians, you have Galatians. Okay, what's baptism about? When is it called for? Under what kind of circumstances? Well, it's under the circumstances of a eager, glad comprehension of and reception of the gospel message, right? The word of Christ. The words preached, the hearts pierced, right? Jesus Christ's arms outstretched to save is laid hold of, right? With, with worship, with trust, with praise. Lord Jesus, you shed your blood for me. Right? You saved me a sinner, and I'm going to stand with you. Right? You stood condemned to die in my place, the just one in place of me, the unjust one. Okay? Those who gladly received Peter's word, they were baptized. Okay? Your experience with baptism may or may not resemble that. I don't really know why you got baptized or under what circumstances for, for most of you, but I would urge you this, that if you got baptized for some reason that does not very much look like this, what you see in this scene, right? The conviction of judgment, the offer of gracious pardon, the supreme majesty and goodness and grace of the Lord Jesus. Well, then if, if, that, if you got baptized for any other reason, I would urge you not to put your trust in the mere fact that you've been baptized. Salvation is a person. Right? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, the person. If the Lord Jesus Christ himself is not all the world to you because he drew you out of the floodwaters of, of condemnation and set your feet on a rock and made your going firm, okay, you had better not rely on the mere fact that some once upon a time you were baptized. And it's important to make that clear because we're in a Baptist church. Chances are you were baptized in the Baptist manner, you know, um, I will tell you, though, it doesn't change the fact that a man cannot see the kingdom of God unless he is born again, right? If Jesus Christ, the man, the, the God man, if he is not the sole source and the sum total of your hope, you're not going to be able to claim being baptized as any kind of a substitute uh, for him, okay? And also, I'd say the remainder of this passage you know, with all this beautiful description of the very early uh, body of believers, if that does not resemble you, I would be in much doubt as to whether your baptism really meant anything. Okay? Like I said earlier, those who are saved and set apart by Christ, they act in certain ways and they do certain things because of what happens in baptism when it's a genuine baptism, uh, that the Holy Spirit, you know, comes and dwells in a person, and, and, and he is regenerated, he is washed, and he becomes new. Okay? Every one of these 3,000 people heard, they were pierced in the heart, they were washed from their sin, and became brand new creatures. Okay? That's why the rest of it is so beautiful, because it was a genuine fellowship of, of brand new believers. Okay? Uh, so, I mean, we're starting to run out of time, but I just want to begin to look at the next verse, 42. Because from 42 on to the end describes how things proceeded for the brand new church after that initial day. Okay, I mean, up till now, we've just been talking about that day's events. Um, but what happens afterwards, right? That's what they say, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? It's, it's, it's one thing to have an experience on a day and, and to hear maybe a powerful word preached and to have a reaction to it. You know, how do you know what's... what really stuck, right? It's the afterwards, uh, which, is, which is what really shows the genuineness of it. Okay, so verse 42 says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship, uh, doctrine meaning teaching and their teaching, right? The apostles, that's what they do is they're teaching the body of believers there, and in the breaking of bread 
and in prayers. Okay? They continued steadfastly. It's a single word in Greek, uh, which is it's a term of loyalty and dedication and persistence. Okay? Another translation says uh, they devoted themselves to. Okay, you get it? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And if you look down a couple verses in 46, you see the same word again, continuing, right? Continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Okay, they continued steadfastly after that, that initial day in which they were uh, cut to the heart and immediately thereafter they're joined to Christ. So you see these, there's four things here in this verse uh, in which they continued steadfastly. Okay, these four things meant everything to the, these newly born again souls. The question is, do they mean everything to you? Do you think they mean everything to, uh, you know, your typical American uh, uh, modern day churchgoer? Right? How can you identify a genuine spirit-filled believer? Right? How can you identify a person who's really been powerfully laid hold of by the word of God, who genuinely has, has, has laid hold of Christ and loves the Lord God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loves his Christian brother the way Christ loved him, well, something like this. They devoted themselves, right? They, con they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayer. Uh, to me, this passage is at one and the same time. It's both wonderful and kind of sad. Um, it's like the description of the Garden of Eden, right? It's like the description of Paradise Lost. Here's something that's beautiful, it's harmonious, um, something that once was, right? You know, imagine being a part of the scene here, a part of this early fellowship, you know, gathering in the temple court someplace and, you know, having their little, uh, well, not little, um, but having their, their group meeting. Okay, how exciting it must have been and how full of vitality. You know, these things are happening in our own days, right before our own eyes. The Messiah has come, he's been raised, uh, and, and the message is going forth. But it really would have been exciting to be a part of that, right? And, uh, so much joy, peace. Uh, and, you know, you're still occupied by the Romans, you know, you're still Jerusalem, and, you know. But now these things have happened to us, right? And it's something like the Garden of Eden, you know, such eagerness and you know wonder let's discover every day's a new discovery it's more learning you know there's such a good feeling among the brothers well, what happened to that you know where did that where did that go and why is it kind of a rare thing to find anymore uh, there's a proverb that says a faithful man who can find it's, it's proverbs chapter 20 verse 6 right most men will proclaim their steadfast love Right? Most men will proclaim their own steadfast love, but a faithful man, who can find? Really, I mean, the, the case is it's hard to find people who will, will be committed in this way, right? To be devoted, right? Committed to these four things. True doctrine, right? I'm committed to learning from the word of God. I, I have a hunger to learn, right? From the apostles and the prophets. I'm committed to the fellowship. Um, you know, we have our church covenant which says it's basically making a commitment, right? We engage to walk together in Christian love. We engage to give and receive admonition with meekness and affection. Uh, we engage to be slow to take offense, always to be ready for reconciliation, mindful of our Savior's rules to uh, secure that without delay. Okay, committed to the fellowship. Committed to the breaking of bread. I love this, breaking bread from house to house. You're talking about home fellowships. Right? Meals around the table with the Lord, uh, breaking bread from house to house with, with gladness and simplicity of heart, uh, and of course, finally committed to prayer. Right? Together in prayer with one accord, right? together going uh, as, a, as brothers and sisters, uh, sons and daughters of the Father, going to the Lord God through his son, Jesus Christ. So sweet. Right? And, and to me, so worth making all the efforts we can to to recover that, don't you think? It's, it's, and, and to me, I guess this is the function of a church covenant. You know, we, we read it once a year, but we really kind of need to get it out. But the function of having one is to make that commitment, 
right? We say we're going to kind of aim for this ideal. We're going to, we'd like to return to that sweet state of the early church, okay? But the proverb says, most men will proclaim their own unfailing love, but a faithful man who can find. So I would pray that the Lord would find us faithful, right? I would pray that the Lord would forgive us for our lapses, forgive us for our weakness, forgive us for our lack of devotion. Um, you know, look what the devil has done. Of course, you can blame it on him, but, you know, he's got a lot, to, a lot of material to work with, of, you know, what's in our hearts. You know, he's got a lot of ways to uh, get us to split off uh, from our commitments, okay? Look how sin has degraded the church over the years. And I, and I would pray that the Lord would have us, you know, cause us to picture ourselves, oh, if we could only have been part of this, what would it be like to be a part of this kind of a fellowship, this joyful, blessed, uh, early fellowship of, of the saved, right? That the Lord would give us that uh, gladness and simplicity of heart, which you read about here, which you know is very, very pleasing in the Lord's sight, okay? Pray that the Lord would restore, as the psalm says, restore to me the joy of my salvation and, and uh, fill us with his Holy Spirit. So let's pray for that, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you uh, again for your word. Uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, this record of um, a, a good thing done uh, by your Holy Spirit, uh, a wonderful fellowship of saintly believers, people who, uh, uh, not perfect, but have come out of sin, have turned their back on uh, sin and lies and false hopes and have clung to the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray this for our church, Lord. I pray it for churches all around our neighborhood and, and your people all over the world, Father, that you would restore uh, what uh, seems to have been lost and corrupted, that, that innocence uh, before the devil came in and sowed confusion and lies and jealousy and uh, uh, um, rivalries, sectarianism, all of these things, Lord, that set your people one against another uh, and cause confusion and, and, and sorrow and 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 let's be honest, bring shame to your name. Oh, that your name might be glorified, Lord God, that your people would be one in heart and one in spirit and devoted to the truth, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers, Lord God. Uh, please uh, begin such a good work here at First Baptist. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the spirit that we do share and we pray, Lord, that you would help us to refine and purify that spirit and uh, love one another and love you, Lord, as we ought to do, as you've loved us with such a perfect love. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is our prayer. Amen.